Okay, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am joined by Lisa Copeland. How are you doing, Lisa? I'm great. How are you? Good. And you are in Texas today, I think? I am. I'm in Austin, Texas, at home in my office. Excellent. Excellent. And Lisa has over 25 years of proven sales experience. She's an author of several books, another one coming out, I think, powerful keynote speaker. Uh, She has uh, a long track record in the automotive space and uh, has talked to some of the and worked with some of the biggest companies in the world. And one of the books that she um, co-authored, which I think is just really interesting, given the world that we live in today. Today is this idea, and uh, the book is called "Crushing Mediocrity: Ten Ways to Rise Above the, st- the Status Quo." And I love that idea because I'm I'm such a believer in the fact that mediocrity in many ways has become the new norm because we've lowered standards and we've kind of been overcome by this casual culture where eh, we think it's it's okay to do just enough, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, we we talk about it in the book. I mean, it even gets down to participation trophies. You know, everybody's a winner. Well, if everybody was a winner, I mean, why why would we have, you know, league sports? If everyone's a winner, how do businesses succeed? How do we beat our competitors? How do we keep America number one when it comes to trade and, and business and commerce? And so, you know, mediocrity to me is, is what's ruining America. It isn't even, it's ruining the business culture around the world. You know, it isn't even just about, it isn't even just about, you know, um, uh, uh, feel, uh, you know, uh, not doing well or mm-hmm. failing. It's about just living in the middle, not wanting to go that extra step to, to, to reach the greatest heights that you can reach. And that's why we wrote the book, because my co-author and I um, both have broke world sales records in our respective industries. Yeah, and I and and I think I always wondered about that, the, you know, the participation trophy piece and that, uh, uh, because I mean, I did when I was when my son son was really young. You know, I I coached the local soccer team for a while, right? And you know, they the league told us, oh, you know, no keeping score, no all of this and that. And I always wondered, okay, at what point in the child life you tell them actually that's not true, all of this is fake, and guess what? There's winners and losers in life. There are. And, you know, and I think that the sooner that we set uh, children up for that, the more successful they're going to be. Just because you lose doesn't mean you're a loser. It just needs you need to play better next time. And hopefully, if you've got a good coach, if you lost, they coach you through why you didn't win so that the next time you hit the field, you're better for it. So let's explore. There's, uh, I think in the book you have 10 uh, tried and true principles. So let, let's explore a number of them. What would you say is the, if there is one overriding and most important principle, what is it? It's purpose. It's chapter one. It's I, I talk about it in every book I write. I talk about it in every keynote speech I give. If you don't know why you're doing what you're doing, then other people don't know why either. Mm-hmm. And so what is it? So so explore that a little more. So say, I mean, you broke records in 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 sales in the in the automobile industry. Like what what made what made you get to that point and what was your purpose and how did you even discover your purpose? Oh, that's a great question. Thank you. You know, my purpose personally was to revolutionize the auto industry. When I decided to relaunch the Fiat brand back to the United Mm -hmm. States, I decided that, you know, I wasn't just going to do it to do it. Um, It was going to be a lot of work. Um, You know, I actually helped write a lot of the launch proposals for um, the Fiat brand to relaunch in the U.S., And I decided that at this point in my life and this point in my career, it needed to be a purpose-driven business, meaning that it was going to matter, that what I did mattered to an industry. And um, so for me, it was was empowering women consumers, and it was empowering women, minorities, and millennials to, um, to stick their toe into the auto industry, because I know what a great opportunity it is, but that is, those are three sectors that are frozen out pretty heavily. And so I was willing to do the work and do whatever it took. If indeed I could help be a revolutionary in the auto industry that's so important to our to our country's economy. And when I relaunched Fiat, it was in 2010, mm-hmm. and we were coming out of our darkest days uh, in right. the U.S. 08, uh, 08, 09, and 10. Our whole economy was in the tank, but especially the automotive industry. 
So, I mean, conventional wisdom at the time would have said, you're crazy bringing, launching, <laughs> trying to relaunch um, Fiat into the American market when yeah, no, we have car companies going out of business, people, yeah. car, um, you know, car buying is down, people, consumer spending is down, all of that. So what, what, made you, what made you believe that, you know, this is a good time? You know, I don't know that, oh my God, that's, it, you ask really great questions. <laughs> Um, you know, nobody believed it was except for me, you know, the Fiat brand left the U S the first mm -hmm. time. Uh, and I know it's still in many markets or it was around the world as fix it again, Tony. So people said to me, you know, you're, you're coming out of a successful other franchise. You, you want to relaunch, fix it again, Tony. <laughs> but I believed in my very soul that sometimes there's a moment in time that you know that you're going to be able to write your legacy. And I knew for me, it was go big or go home. Either, either it was going to be a smashing success or I was going to have to go, and figure out my next career move because the automotive industry would not have had me back again. <laughs> so yeah, fix it. Or, again, I, mean, I mean, I would have been a complete laughing stock. Yeah. So there's a so there's a, a really interesting point there, right? So you made that decision that you didn't want to go with the safe option, right? And you were going to put yourself out there. And I think you know, obviously, there's a lot of people who bump along and they think, eh, I'll just stick with the safe option. Um, what what is your that is so, that is mediocrity. Mm -hmm. So so what is maybe a second uh, principle that you'd pick out that can really lift people out of this kind of comfort zone, the safety of the status quo? <laughs> I think you had to have read my book because mm -hmm. one of our chapters is to exit your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And and when I speak on it, you know, I talk about fear because you know danger is real and fear is a choice. Right. But fear keeps us bound up. Every single one of us bound up. And you know, psychology today says that ninety six percent of what we fear never materializes. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, it's you know, it rents so much space in our head. So, um, you know, when when we when we talk about that, getting out of your comfort zone. Sometimes getting out of your comfort zone just means day one you make the decision. Right. Day two, you take the next step. You know, you learn to fear less, not to be fearless, because to be fearless is to be reckless, but mm -hmm. to fear less and to challenge yourself to take one step you wouldn't have taken the day before. You know, success, you know, the, success isn't easy. And if it was, everybody would do it. But I tell people success also leaves clues. So if you if you look at successful people, if you look at what they do and how they do it, and believe me, I've studied many, many mm -hmm. successful people. I mean, I'm a student at heart. That's what I do all day long, every day. I read about what other people do and how they do it. And then I try to take the best of the best because success leaves clues mm -hmm. and make it my own. And that's really, you know, why I think I had the guts to launch Fiat again, because I, I believed that we could build a story about around the relaunch of that brand back to the U.S. That, that the fiat out of Italy was going to save the American economy by saving the Chrysler Corporation. Mm -hmm. And it did and it did. And people bought our story because it isn't what you sell. It's what you stand for. If you stand for something big enough, people buy what you're selling. And we stood for saving the U.S. economy. And that fiat brand had to make it for Fiat to bail out the Chrysler Corporation. Yeah, and th that's fantastic because there's about three huge um, uh, ideas and points in, the, in what you've just said. Let me just go back to one quickly is is the step by step because i do think that is often it's either it either paralyzes people or it's an almost like a get out of jail free card is when they say i want to do this big thing but they don't want to take those first small steps because sometimes the first small steps seem insignificant or they're not very exciting or whatever it is. So they yeah. just, so they go, oh, well, I can't do it because I have to yeah. do these little steps first. And people resist that, right? Yes, a million percent. And you're right. There was, you know, I, I was asked the other day, I, I spoke at uh, Ambit Energy, which was their national sales meeting, 4,000 entrepreneurs in the audience. And, and, you know, one of the statements I made, they came up to me afterwards and they said, is it true? And I said, in the five years that I did that, I had five good days. Mm. And one of those days was the day that we broke the world sales record. The second day was the day that I got to meet Mr. Marchione, who was the former, former chairman of the board who recently passed away. Um, yeah, there, I mean, there were five good days and the rest of them were to hell. They were hell. But I knew what my underlying purpose was. And it was to revolutionize the industry. And I had a lot of people counting on me to do it. And so there's nothing sexy, easy or fun typically about that type of success. That's why your purpose, your underlying purpose is critical to staying the course, 
on the other, uh, let's see, 360 days times five years. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and that's a that's a great point that you've touched on there because it's another thing that is a kind of pet peeve of mine as well, but this idea that I don't know where it's come from, but this idea that you should enjoy and be happy in your work every day, right? I mean, this nonsensical yeah. idea, I mean, it's work for, re- called work for a reason, right? You should, as you say, you know, the results... The outcomes should make you happy, but it's it's crazy to think that you know every day you should be happy in what you're doing because some of the things you need to do in order to be successful, quite frankly, are not enjoyable. They're not enjoyable. They're not easy, and that's where purpose always has to be your number one. And you know, I think some of the great. I mean, think about a couple purpose driven jobs um, that we know of: police officers, mm-hmm. first responders, people that fight in our military. Okay, those to me are very purpose driven jobs. They mm-hmm. wake up every single morning knowing that their job is to serve and protect. And I truly, truly, and none of those people do it for the combat pay. Right. So, how fun is that job every single day? But how much satisfaction does it give them when they save somebody's life, when they defend our country, when they or or defend their country, whatever it may be? So there's nothing easy about those jobs, but they're very purpose driven. And the satisfaction comes from them knowing their underlying purpose of serving and protecting. Yeah. And the other thing that you mentioned earlier was this learning from others. I mean, there. So, I mean, once upon a time, maybe you had an excuse. I mean, there were still libraries. You could go down and read books about people. You could read newspapers. Okay. But let's say there wasn't. Let's say you lived in some place with no library and you didn't have money to buy books. Okay, maybe you had an excuse not to learn from other people. But right. with the, with the internet, with people like you, with video, with all this information out there about what makes people successful, there is really no excuse uh, for not learning from other people now, is there? There, there really isn't. And you know, and you have to invest in yourself. You know, you've got to be the best version of you. And there are so many people that I follow that that I admire, you know, and and I have befriended those people. I've got some pretty powerful friends. And and I learn from them and I call them my tribe. And um, you know, I started my own mastermind. I've close to nineteen hundred people in it now, and I'm real funky yeah. about who I let in it because mm-hmm. it's gotta be people that feed other people. You know, I wanna inspire others to inspire others. And so I think that if I say something to you or your listeners today, my hope and my prayer is that they would pass it on to somebody that, mm-hmm. that did not listen to the broadcast. Yeah, but no. Uh, anybody for not listening to this broadcast, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, absolutely no excuse. Um, and so the other part was the story. And I think this is a piece, again, uh, if you bring it back to sales, like salespeople in general, or generally speaking, um, are pretty good storytellers, yes. but they don't always have the best story to tell, or they haven't always formulated their story properly. And that's why I really liked what you said about, I mean, that's such a powerful story saying, you know, Fiat and the Italian car maker is going to save the U.S., you know, car. But it was a true story. Mm-hmm. And, but, and it is what inspired me to jump in. In my mind, if this launch goes well, and, and and we show the nation what we can do. Other dealers will follow suit and we will save. I mean, that underlying purpose. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So I mean, so salespeople have to go out and find or, or work on finding the number one, their purpose and the story that really articulates that purpose so they can connect mm-hmm. with people in a meaningful way. What's uh, what's another of the principles that you think uh, be worth calling out? Um, you know, one of them is, um, is is to stand out. And it isn't to stand out so that you are like a showboat. See, mm-hmm. I hate showboats. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I just, eh, you know, it, 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 you know, anytime I had somebody who was about them and not the mission, they didn't really, they didn't usually stay with me for a long time. Not because right. I got rid of them, just because eh, they really weren't my people. And, um, but to stand out in excellence in everything you do, because you see, again, just like we talked about, it's tough, it's hard, it's hard to be successful. But if, if it's your job to root, root for your boss, root for your team, root for other people, be, be that one who sets an excellent example when, you know, when you're not at the water cooler and you're not talking back poorly about people, you're there because, because of your underlying purpose. So standing out in an organization, those were always the people I looked out for promotion. You know, I didn't care about the person who was number one because they were typically a showboat. And <laughs> that's great. And I love their success. Believe me. I mean, we all need our showboats and our number ones, too. But I, I looked for people that I could promote, bring up through the brand, uh, on the bench, um, people that were standouts in character and in work ethic and really how they rooted for their teammates and how they rooted for me. Because mm-hmm. as the boss, I needed that on a daily basis. You know, I mean, it was it was a tough launch and it, we had five tough years um, between recalls and stop sales and all of the <laughs> stuff that the brand went through. I mean, you can't even make this stuff up. Um, 
And so, you know, the ones that really stood behind me in the trenches, you know, that, that, that meant a lot to me. And I think that gets back to that, the idea of, um, you know, people having pride in what they do in, in yeah. personal accountability, because that's the other thing that we, I mean, we talk about a lot. Or I talk about a lot is this idea of accountability, like everybody agrees with the idea of accountability, but they always a lot of people believe that it begins with you being accountable, not me being accountable. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, how much of that do you think is what drives people to rise above mediocrity is the fact that they start to take accountability for their own circumstances and then they want to do the best they can at what they're doing right now, even if that's not what they ultimately want to do? A million percent. You know, you don't you don't owe me a job and you don't owe me success and, and I don't owe you the same. It's, you know, it's all about here and it's about inside of me. And that's where purpose is such a driver. I mean, People ask me all the time, there's got, at least there's got to be something other than purpose. No, there's not. Otherwise, it's just a job. Mm-hmm. I mean, then, then you're just doing it for the money. And, you know, and we were, we were uh, continually the number one store in the country for both Fiat and Alfa Romeo. And um, month in, month out, year in, year out. And, you know, and I said, but, you know, we were a purpose-driven organization that happened to sell a few cars along the way. Right, right, and yeah. I mean it's and it's interesting. And yeah, I mean you picked you picked two cars there, right? That um, that great cars, but you certainly had some uh, perception issues to overcome, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so in the last couple of minutes, maybe one other, just um, touch on one other principle. You know, um, I think that it is um, standing together. You know, standing, you know, not just being a stand out, but to stand together and to be united, to be somebody who is a uniter. You know, there's a lot of people in the world, you know, mediocrity, you know, those are a lot of times those are people who are who, who stand on their own. They're all about them. And so, you know, there is no I in team mm-hmm. and you can't do great things. You can't crush mediocrity most of the time by yourself. Right. You've got to be able to. um unify a team, you know, galvanize people, be that leader. And, and, you know, and to be a leader, you've got to be somebody people want to follow. Mm-hmm. And so um, the greatest people I know that, that have crushed mediocrity and in business and in life, and if you look through history, are people that knew how to galvanize people who knew how to build a movement, who knew how to do, you know, do something that was bigger than themselves, and it benefited more than themselves. You know, I mean, we did what we did for an industry and and our common enemy was the industry itself. I stood against the industry, but I knew that my clients and the people that actually bought cars would would stand with us. So and so just to quickly. So when you were um, when you were, um, you know, bringing Fiat and Alfa Romeo back, what role did your cust- did your customers ultimately play in the success? Cause you say, talk about building a movement. So your team behind yeah. you. But what role did your customers play? Uh, it was everything. Mm-hmm. If, um, if 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 the customers didn't buy into what we were doing in the land of trucks and SUVs, and they didn't believe what we were saying and why we were doing it, we would have never sold cars. And if we didn't sell cars, we wouldn't have been the number one store in the country. Mm-hmm. So I give our customers one million percent of the credit. Yeah. And where were some of the things? I mean, did they? I mean, when they bought into it, they obviously became you know oh, evangelists. Raging. They did. They were they were evangelists, evangelists from the street tops. I mean, on social media, they would bring customers. It was it was a beautiful thing. I, I don't know that I don't know that I, I could ever recreate it. Mm-hmm. I really don't. I, I, I don't know that I have that in me twice in a lifetime. But um, to live that five years with those customers who just you know, when, when 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 things went bad, they oh, my God, they could have just unloaded on us and they mm-hmm. didn't. They stood with us. They were patient. They said, we believe in you because we know you'll fix it. We believe in the brand. We know that you guys are going to do the right thing. It was it was amazing. Yeah. Amazing moment in time. And I think that's another fantastic takeaway for people here. And another thing that we talk about a lot here is the customer experience, because if you deliver a fantastic customer experience, when you have issues, which you will, there's no there's no brand product or service. Exactly. Right. Uh, If you have been consistent and positive in the experience that you're delivering, they will stand with you through that. A million percent. Okay, before we go, um, Lisa, I think you have a special offer for our viewers here with the Crushing Mediocrity book, which you've heard is an excellent, look at this, is is something that I really encourage people to read. So if you want to tell people what the special offer is. So, all right. So for all of our viewers in the US and Canada, if you want to text Big Cell, one word, B-I-G-S-E-L-L 
to 345345. Text big cell one word to 345345. You'll receive a copy of our book. But if you email me personally and you're in any other part of the country, I will send you a copy. That's lisa at lisacopeland.com. Lisa at lisacopeland.com. Send me an email and we will send you a soft copy of our book, full book, uh, full from Amazon, um, Crushing Mediocrity, 10 Ways to Rise Above the Status Quo. Wow. Well, that's quite an offer. So either text uh, in the US or email if you're outside the US. That's uh, yes. Well, thank you, Lisa. That's a fantastic offer for our viewers. And I really appreciate your time today. And this is a fascinating story. And uh, I hope you'll come back and maybe we'll discuss um, more of these uh, principles in the not too distant future. I would love to. Thanks for having me. Okay, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM, Lisa Copeland in Texas. Thank you very much for tuning in. I'll see you all for another expert interview really soon. So I encourage you to subscribe to salespop.net, the online sales magazine. Also subscribe to our YouTube channel and then comment. Get involved in the conversation. Love to hear what you have to say.